Kind of file in and grab a seat, that would be great. Hey, Barry, how are you? Doing well. How are you? You didn't have to go. I did not go to the no. One volunteer in the family was not. We got anybody hiding out out there? Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to welcome you all to our, I think this is our fourth annual Ag Seminar from uh, High Desert Conservation District. I think it's four, maybe five. Four. Four. Uh, I'm Steve Miles. I'm on the Board of Directors with uh, High Desert Conservation District. We've got Suzanne Aiken here. She's our president. And I saw David Temples on the board. Uh, Jim's on the board. Well, oh, Joanne, of course. <laughs> she, she's been on almost as long as I've been on. And is that it? And does everybody know Katie? She's the research center director. She was gracious enough to let us use this facility. We appreciate it very much. Yeah, uh, And we've got Greg Blaming. Where's Greg? Here. Greg's... Uh, a technician that works for the conservation district, called a DCT technician, and it's a pass-through thing from the state. The conservation district pays for part of his salary and operations, and we get money from the state to help the conservation district as well as NRCS. And I think we had some NRCS. Was Joel here? He was. He's on phone. Did he bail out? No, he's here, but yeah. Okay, he's on the phone. Uh, but Greg works with the Conservation District and also with uh, NRCS, and so he can kind of help out on some of our projects that aren't in the NRCS purview, I guess. Uh, and we have Blair Lees. Blair is a professional contractor, I guess you want to call it, from Durango with Raptor Imaging. He uh, has a business over in Durango, and this little gizmo behind him is one of his toys. And he's going to help me out on the second part of this presentation. Uh, but, like I said, this is the fourth annual Ag Seminar from the High Desert Conservation District. Every fall we have it. We also have seminars during the summer, if you kind of watch on the website on things like irrigation water management and uh, let's see, we've done soil health stuff, some things on grazing. Um, but upcoming we've got some our annual tree sales. We're going to do it a little bit differently I think this year because we had an availability problem. So uh, get a hold of uh, Victoria, our district manager who's not here but representing her is her husband right here. So we can throw darts? At yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make sure if those points get passed. <laughs> okay, and upcoming we've got our tree sales. We have a master steward program coming up. I think we'll do it in January. It's a nine-week program, one day, one evening a week. It's a real thorough thing on how to get things... Hi, Gail. <laughs> how to get things set up uh, on a farm. And uh, this past year, I guess you probably all know we, we were spent quite a bit of our time and energy working on a mill levy that we had to cancel due to some irregularities. And, uh, but we are going to go ahead and try for a mill levy in two years from now, a year and a half from now. So if you're interested in that, that's something to help keep the district functioning. We operate off of very soft money. It's our grants are continually being cut back, like everything else. You know, do more with less. So, 
pay attention to that. Uh, and we're working with Fozzie's Farm. We've got Jay here with Fozzie's Farm and MLC. Interesting project going on. Pay attention to what's, what's happening on that. And uh, highdesertconservation.org. You can go there. There's information if you're interested. Okay, this is going to be sort of a two-part seminar, and we're kind of playing with the weather. And what I'd like to do is I'll go through a little presentation quickly on sort of the visual things of what you can do with the drone. I've been playing around as an amateur hobbyist with the drone for a year or so. I've flown RC airplanes and kind of like the view. We'll do kind of a practical side, what maybe we can use on our farms, uh, how, how we can use it with kind of a entry-level drone, which is this one here. It's a Phantom DJI. It's about $2,000 by the time you get set up. But it's got some pretty professional stuff in it. It's not like your uh, $49, $99 thing you get off of Amazon. There's some pretty technical things in it you can do with it. Uh, and then we move on up. And so I'll go over some of the practical things, you know, quickly with a presentation. I've got a few videos on here so you can kind of see what's the perspective. And then, but we could go outside. If it's not raining and blowing too much, we'll fly around a little bit and fly over the orchard. And then you kind of get an idea on how these things operate. And uh, again, if the weather's cooperating, we'll get Blair to fly his high-end precision ag drone, and I think, did you get a map set up? No, I haven't yet, but that doesn't take Okay, we, you know, he can kind of show you what you do on the precision side. Um, so, let me kind of go through this. Can you all see? Hey, do you have the lights turned on a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Where's that switch? Yeah. Okay, you know, I wanted to go through some of the rules and regulations. There's a lot of you know, you can buy the things on Amazon or whatever, but there are rules and regulations. It is regulated by the FAA. They've gone back and forth. They're not clear at all. You go on the website right now, and it's 2014 stuff. One of the main hobby industries, um, the AMA, is the American Modelers Association, is fighting Congress to try to maintain some sense out of the drone business. But these aren't all the rules uh, and they're not necessarily current. Just two weeks ago I think Blair said the Trump administration changed another rule. Uh, so you got to kind of stay on top of it. But the FAA does regulate it. You can't fly above 500 feet. You can't fly near an airport within five miles of an airport uh, or any declared area whenever they decide they want to declare an area. So if it's a fire, an emergency, a car wreck, whatever, they can say you can't fly. And you've got to pay attention to it. Um, Are there websites to check in on regularly? Is that what you're doing to find out? I do that, <clears throat> excuse me, I do that on a regular basis. Uh, they put up tempor temporary flight restrictions, which is what Steve right. was referring to. And if we have those, we can't fly. It's like when yeah, they I'll had, well, the 416 fire and the fire last summer over in Durango, mm -hmm. people were wanting to get pictures with their drone. They ground <coughs> the aircraft. And they, they can't fly any aircraft if there's drones in the air. And it's up to like a $30,000 fine if they mm -hmm. catch it. And they did catch the one guy, and I don't know what they did to him. I hope they put him I hope they just, because it's yeah. dangerous. Yeah. So there's, there's a no-fly zone. There's a little thing you put on your phone called Air Maps. It's updated. And you can look on air maps, but you can't fly national parks. The Forest Service, each forest dictates what they want to do. And there's a big distinction between hobby and professional or commercial. A hobbyist can fly without a license, but a commercial person has to have a license, a 107 license. And you got to go through the hoops to do it. And, uh, you know, there's a question on the hobbyist thing is, you know, you can't get paid. But, but some people are saying, well, I can get reimbursed my expenses as a hobbyist. And it's a real loosey-goosey thing 
but you just need to be aware of the FAA is running the show on this. Uh, so a drone, uh, unmanned aircraft system, is anything operated by somebody that's not in the cockpit. And this could be a frisbee. Technically, any, you, you throw a paper airplane and they've got jurisdiction. Uh, if it's capable of sustaining flight, if it weighs anywhere between, I think it's a half an ounce and 55 pounds, that's considered an unmanned, or a, yeah, unmanned aircraft, UAS system. Uh, and you can kind of see why, because, you know, you can take a payload of this stuff and crash it into a water supply, and guess what? I mean, there's just, the potential is astounding. And, and I, can, I totally understand the regulations on it. Uh, my drone, we were playing around down by the airport. We were like five miles away from the airport. And I was getting a signal on mine, you know, giving me a warning. You know, that you are in, you know, class B airspace. You know, it depends on the type of airport you're at. And we were flying around. And then we thought, well, let's see how accurate this thing is. And we moved over, you know, over onto road where Fraley's lot is there, and tried to take off, and it wouldn't let me take off. It, it shut, the drone won't take off. And so the software is in the high-end drones, or higher-end drones, not to do it, but that doesn't mean you can't jigger around it. Uh, you're supposed to have a spotter, and the biggest one is in the United States, you have to have visual sight of the drone by the spotter and the pilot, the guy running the uh, receiver. has to be visual line of sight. So you can imagine trying to see this at a thousand feet. And we'll, we'll fly around and you can see. So this whole idea of Amazon being able to deliver packages, plus you cannot fly from a moving vehicle. So, you know, those are the rules of the United States. All the, the advertising and stuff you see, the drones flying around, going through parks and stuff, that's all done in China or some other country. It's not done in the United States. For, you know, you cannot, you're not supposed to. Uh, okay, they drones fly off of GPS systems, and there are, well, they have GPS systems, visual obstruction sensors. This one's got infrared sensors, it's got uh, visual sensors forward and back and sideways and down below and we'll, we'll be able to see some of that coming on. But if you lose the GPS signal, your drone's flying wild. So, you know, if you're down in a canyon or something like that filming out in the Dolores River and you lose signal to one of those satellites, you don't know what's, where that drone's going. And so you got to really be aware of what's going on. Reflections off of windows, water, other flat surfaces cause uh, problems. I know this firsthand because I flew into my solar panels and did a major wreck. It, it could not sense it, so it was too much reflection. Flying over water, you're flying over McPhee or something like that. Besides dumping your two thousand drone in the water, two thousand dollar drone in the water. You know, it's, it's, you can't get that imaging off of reflective no stuff, so you got to be careful. Low light. Um, so line of sight, this first person view using goggles is not legal. There's, you know, where you put goggles on, it's like you're sitting in the cockpit of the, your drone flying around. That is not considered line of sight. You cannot do that. Um, basic rules. Okay, like this has got a flight range of four miles. Well, you can't see that man, four miles. Yeah. With regard to the goggles, is it the case that it's not considered line of sight, but you can still do it as long as you maintain line of sight? If, if you've got a spotter maintaining line of sight, you could do that. So it's, but, not, it's, not, the the pilot, are, it's not the goggles that are illegal, it's that you can't use it as line of sight. You can't use it as line of sight. Okay. And, and the thing with line of sight is, you're looking forward. You have got no idea what's going on beside you, up below you, anything. You can't turn, you know, you don't know what's going on. Right. And so it's pretty spooky. 
I don't, you're not supposed to fly in public places. You don't fly in parks. There were some people flying in, you know, Parque de Vida two weeks ago, you know, over the soccer fields. I, you know, you're not supposed to be doing that kind of stuff. Watch out for hazards. Obviously, power lines, obstructions. These will not sense a power line. I was flying out at Jim's place, and it would sense corn. I was trying to see if I could fly directly into the corn to see if the sensors it wouldn't pick it up. It's too scattered, but I can fly into a tree, you know, towards a tree, and it'll stop four feet away from the tree. But for some reason, it wasn't picking up the corn. So all these sensing things are not foolproof. Um, and then the catch-all phrase is, you know, on it is you must fly in a safe manner and follow the rules of a local community-based. Uh, called Hobby Club, which is AMA. And it's just so loosey-goosey, you know, right now, you know, like I said, they're, they're writing the rules, they go back and forth for a while. A year and a half ago, you had to register everything, all your drones, your model airplanes, everything had to be registered. They dropped that in February, they put it back on again, everyone's got to be registered. It just goes back and forth. Uh, and the the privacy issues are huge. You know, flying over somebody's backyard. You know, it, it just, you got to have some common sense about it. But I think in agriculture, the nice thing about it is we, we're looking at our own property. You know, we don't have the obstructions. We don't have, um, you know, a lot of the problems. We, I was working on a project in, for the Forest Service. I was a spotter for another guy who's got a license, and we got interference off of a cat engine when he started it up. Mm -hmm. The magnetic force of starting up a big cat engine, you just see the drone do this and it headed to the ground. And, and so the magnetic force off of starting up that big engine, you know, he's just starting up to, to warm it up, it just went bang, right into the ground. How close were you? 75 feet. I didn't think there'd be, and that's the only thing we can figure out that happened, is that the, the magnetic field off of that, that cat engine. Um, so I've got four short videos, just to kind of give you an idea of the perspective of, of stuff I've flown around here, and then we go outside and fly around a little bit, and, and I thought I'd just fly over the orchard, then you, we've got a big monitor we can set up so everybody can see what I'm seeing on this on this little screen. This is the uh, the receiver, and I'm looking at this screen, and uh, the drones. This is a, a quad. They've got like six and eight props on it, and the way they operate is each prop. There's two of them run one direction, two on the other direction, and that's how they get their steering. So, you know, once two are running clockwise, two are running counterclockwise, and so that's what gives you the ability to do this. And then they change the speeds in it. So it's, it's kind of a technical, there's a pretty neat chip in there somewhere uh, that makes them fly. But it's just, again, it's all, you know, things that can go wrong. Just be aware of it. Okay, this first one is a center pivot. This is some irrigation stuff. You start out with some raw video, they're just huge files, and then you can cut them down. So I took a, a 15 minute video. Let me see if I can stop this here. Oop, we didn't want to do that. Let's go backwards here. Now we're all messed up. Okay, here we are. Okay, this is, I kind of speeded it up on this, like twice the speed that I'm flying at. Just kind of playing around. You can see like the 180 nozzle there. Okay, here I slowed up. This is real, real speed here. We're over here doing this. See, here's a leak here on this drop. See how this nozzle a little bit twisted. Here's another leak here. Look at the water down in here. You know, what's causing all this? See that? But, but there's enough detail to see 
whether they're working or not. Now I'm moving closer into the tower, so you've got less and less water coming out of those nozzles, and it's getting a little bit more difficult. And I'm probably 30 feet off of off the pipe, 30, 40 feet, and you know, 30 feet high. So that's on a center pivot. This is some impact sprinklers. This is at my place. Okay, like look here. See the spreader nozzle on this one right here is plugged. That spreader nozzle is plugged. So, I mean, that's some detail that you know, might be helpful, like checking side rolls out, that kind of stuff. I did not, okay, I'm, I'm doing a 180 here, and I've got a plug sprinkler right here where the grass, this is handset, and there's some grass. Here's the drone flying. And, you know, there's a shadow of the drone. And right here, see this plug sprinkler? There's some grass stuck in the nozzle. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is flying over some corn out in Yellow Jacket. And, you know, you can see, like, here's some, some potential issues. Like, right in here, we don't really know why. Here's a, an air vac that, you know, they're just not seating around. Okay, right here. Now, watch, watch this right in here. We're three towers out, probably. Uh, I don't know what, this is the kind of visual inspections that we can do in scouting. You're kind of doing two things at once. You're flying the aircraft and also trying to pay attention to what your movie is. And so there's some automation you can do in this, and uh, Blair can demonstrate that. See the issue with the corn here? Now watch what's going on over here on the right. See what we've got? This is a you know, broken up, or, you know, a plug nozzle. This is some game damage here where the elk have got in. And I didn't really know what to look for, and I probably could have got better pictures of this. But, I mean, these are kind of some of the potential things you can do with it. Uh, this is a series of still shots. That, so you, you get a little different thing when you don't have all the motion going on. You can see some of now. This I'm not. I'm shooting down probably a 45 degree angle. Now this is straight down, and this is. Gotta, you might get to see all these again. Here, see this here. What's this about? Is that fertilizer? I wish I could go back on my computer. I could go backwards, but. I don't know if it's fertilizer or the previous year's use of the side roll. But as, as you, you're looking straight down, we're not getting the image we need, I don't think. But see some of these dry spots? At least not, not with visual imaging. Now we get outside of visible light. See these stripes here? You know, what are some of these, the problems we've got here? Okay, well, we tried to get closer in and fly, like, the wheel tracks on this corn to see what we can, you know, if we can get down and look to see if we're going to get stuck, that kind of stuff. And we just weren't getting quite the resolution, and I was a little hesitant to get too much closer. <clears throat> but the stills give you a little bit different. This is some wheat. Oh, I should keep doing that. Anyway, you get the gist, right? <laughs> um, we got a little technical thing here. So this is something, this striping might be helpful. You know, we don't know if there's fertilizer, 
irrigation pattern. Did, did any of you guys see the movie that I took of here when we were setting up of, of the field? There's some of these dry spots. This is new hay, isn't it, Jim? This is all new hay? No, that was the um, regrowth after the water was turned okay. off after second cutting on an older stand. But it, it was representing See the how well the first two irrigations yeah. were managing the moisture profile. Steve, are you, um, are you taking those still shots from your... Uh, from the drum. Right, but I mean, are you controlling those? Are you actually snapping pictures? Yeah, yeah I'm snapping the picture. Okay, so you're not taking those still shots. From and the if you can't, picture. this one, like you can't zoom in on this camera. Some of the newer ones, I think the Mavic and stuff, that will not fit in your shirt pocket, so you can't see them more than 50 feet away. You know, you can, you can zoom in. Uh, these are 4K resolution, which is too high for like this monitor, and I think that's one of the problems, is I need to take this. It, there's 20, 20 megapixels on the camera, really high resolution, so if you've got a monitor, you can really zoom in on your monitor. <coughs> But when you're looking at, I'm using this monitor here, that's why some of this is looking fuzzy, is it can't handle. Uh, and then another question, are you adjusting, you, you mentioned having, you know, kind of an angle to your shots. Are you adjusting that angle from your, your computer? Yeah, there's, this is what's called a gimbal. And this is the camera here. And you have this movement up and down here. But you, you control the angle of it this way. And then this, this camera is going up and down, and you've got an up and down movement that way. And then your angle is by, because otherwise you'd be looking at the legs. Now, I don't, does these, do these legs retract? No, not on this okay. one. Okay. Some of them, they've got legs that retract so that you can hover and not have to move the drone. But, you know, you can spend $30,000 on a drone, you know, if you're excited about it. But, you know, so this is the gimbal, and that's, when, when you'll see the imaging here, the drone can be flying like at this kind of a speed and this angle, but it's all straightened out. It's pretty amazing that it can level everything out. So this is, here's where the money is, is in that camera. Uh, we got sun outside. So I, I was thinking from here, we've got, I, I introduced Blair, and I think let's go outside. We've got a table set up and a monitor we need to get set up at the end of the shop here. And we'll go out and I'll just fly over the orchard, hopefully. And you'll, you'll be able to see some of the shots. Because I want you to kind of get an idea on what you can do with these. Some people have asked me, well, is this something that, you know, I can buy for my farm? Possibly. You know, uh, once you get into the high-end stuff, there's a lot of technical and I, I want to leave plenty of time for Blair to go through his and then questions. Because our, our thoughts are right now, we need to hear from you all as to what, is this going to be a practical technology that we can use on our farms? You know, is this going to save us time? You know, can you fly down a side roll instead of walking a quarter mile? Look, check the nozzles. Can you fly down that and fly back once a week and see if your drains are working? You know, if they're sealed off, you've got plug nozzles or whatever. Uh, we're hoping, we're in the process of writing a grant to try to do a little bit more uh, investigation on this next summer as to, you know, what role can the district do to help in this and see if we can figure out, will this work? Does it work in hay? You know, obviously it works for high-end crops and soybeans and corn and Probably pot, you know, it might be worth having for sure. But, you know, we're trying to figure out how can we use this on our farms. Yeah, Gail. What about cattle? Cattle, we had a conversation. They're putting microchips in ear tags. Hmm. You know, with the right drone, it'll go over and, yeah, I've got, you know, a missing number 279. You know, there, there's a lot of things you can do with it. I don't know where the cattle spook with it. I think you could pretty spook with it. Well, I, I would think. I'm, I'm, why I'm interested is, is 
when I have them down yellow jacket woods in the sandstone, I want to be able to fly over and see where they're at. So I'm not spending 10 hours searching for them. Yeah, and, and that's, that's part of it. But again, get back into the line of sight. <coughs> uh -huh. And, you know, where you're at. They do make, like if this crashes, it's done. Are you ever going to find it? And they do make a little GPS thing you can attach to it that if you've got signal on your phone, you can ask Siri, where's my drone? <laughs> that runs, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Are we going to discuss photogrammetry at all? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We will. I, I want to... I, I, I'm thinking if we go outside and can fly now before the wind comes up, I thought I, I just put a battery in here and we can fly for 10 minutes and then and Blair can fly a little bit. And, and once you see the, we've got a big monitor set up and if it works right, you'll see what I'm seeing on this little screen. And you can see all the little parameters that are in it. You know, you can control the camera, you can do, you know, all these different things, but you're also still being a pilot. How long can you fly with that one battery? Okay, this battery uh, is 165 bucks, and so this is where you know you tie a lot of money up in batteries, and you get about 15 minutes out of it. Now, on a precision ag thing, I think you can fly 40 acres in five minutes. Not quite, but I've also got 40 minutes of flight time. Yeah. On this. So, you know, on the precision, you're flying a pattern. You plug in, and you're, you're taking a map. You're not free-flying this thing. Yeah. You, you take a picture of a map, download it, and, and then you work off of that. And so it's a lot different than free-flight, where you're going, yeah, and you're looking, it's like, do I want that picture, or do I not want that picture? You know, you don't, you don't have all that. Like these little one-minute clips, some of them, well, they were all like 15-minute flights. And then I compressed them down, and so there's a lot of garbage in there. And that 15-minute flight just on a flash drive is, well, I handed you those four flights, and it was 47 gigabytes. You know, so it's a lot of data. Lots of SD cards. Well, it's, <laughs> this is where you, you know, you, you learn what you're doing, and this is where the stills, may be more important, but like those pictures of, of my great handset at my place where things were stuck, I don't, you wouldn't see that in a still. You, you see it in the movie where the spreader nozzles plug. Uh, and so that's, there's, we gotta kind of figure out what to do, and that's what we hope to do next summer. And you know, input from you guys, you know, we can work on that. So there's bathrooms out here in the front, and there's some coffee and some donuts and stuff. If you want to get a quick bite, use the facilities. And we'll go out the other side of the, the shop here. And we'll hook up the monitor. And you can kind of see the whole farm from there. I like flying from a high spot. You set parameters on this of, okay, this, this will come home. If, if everything goes wrong, supposedly it's supposed to land right where you took off. And it's within about a foot. If everything's, you know, so you set parameters in there of, you know, might come home, altitude's this, you know, I don't want to fly any faster than this or any further than this, and, and you'll see all that on the screen. Make any sense? Yeah. Any other questions before we go out there? I think we're okay. Great on tape because practice might still be a small package. Can you guys, can you see that? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to my single for saying it. Keep the chip down. Keep the chip down. Keep the chip down. Keep the chip down. He's just he's arrogant is, is what he is. You know, he just is so good and knows everything and he's like, no. It was like he, he took my time to come from the ring and go to Dub to have a discussion about how that I talk to you about that the survey. Yeah. You guys see that? Me about uh, I asked you to take a look, look at it, but that's yeah. not the results. Yeah. I got two responses. Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I mean, it's, it is what it is. I still have to write a paper and say, like, what change and all that. Okay, what you're seeing is what I'm seeing on this. And Survey did on that one. See, like, it has not picked up any satellites yet. Those red, the yellow bars down below. This is showing up about 16 feet behind me. So, if Mr. Hennis had moved, yeah. that would go away. <laughs> Uh, and then this is in front, 22, this is all about, here's the satellites, this is my vision system, next is, okay, the camera thing, I'm going to change, uh, okay, let me just check, see the return to home altitude, I said 50 meters, Maximum altitude, 120 meters. Flight distance, 750 meters. Uh, this can all be put into Imperial units too, so you know my feet. Yeah. 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 Okay, this forward, backward sensing. Do I need to go back to school? Here's that. Okay, here's my camera. Okay, see it says work frequency, 2.4 gigahertz. That's cell phone. I'm going to change that to 5.8 gigahertz so different frequency cell phone will mess up and this is the talking on the camera side of it. okay uh, here's my battery I've got a critical battery warning low battery 30% critical warning at 15 it will shut down and fly home no matter what you're doing once it gets to that 15% and you can change all that uh, okay this is the gimbal first person view to follow uh, looks like I'm all good here. So this map here, this is kind of a map of what what's going on. Let me pull some layers up here. Well, I can't do layers. Well, here we go. Guess the name's because I don't have my Wi-Fi signal. There's maps behind this. See, here, here's the regular Google Maps right there. See, there's Yellow Jacket. You see that? No, way on the bottom. I want to break that out. Okay, see, here's 491, the highway, and here's the county roads. Okay, here's what we're seeing. So we're right here. But anyway, let me get... Here's okay. This is what the camera's seeing right now. Okay, you see where it says "ready to go" up here, the green. I've got my satellites. Are you free flying this? Yeah, but well, it hasn't told me that if I've got my. Uh, Okay, here's my home point. <laughs> you see how that's wobbling? You know, the gimbal, when you see this, it takes all that wobble out of it. So like right now, you see the cars? <coughs> okay, I'm going to just fly down that fence line. 
Try to go pretty slow. I'm hoping. Um, Dennis Bull came out this spring. I had four pair down yellow jacket, and we flew yellow jacket, and he found me from. So. So you here to ride that 12 miles, or spend 10 or, hours? Uh, yeah. Multiple so see, times. here's the here's our Multiple orchard. Times, yeah. So I can fly over one of the rows. Right now, I'm at 54 feet high. Reading down here, it gives you the elevation of what, and that's 54 feet from where I'm standing, or where it took off. It's not 54 feet above what's below it. So as the ground goes up, it's saying you got 54 feet of elevation, but that's elevation at your home point, not elevation below you. So... Does it tell you when below, below it? There, there is, when you're within 20 feet of the ground, it'll start giving you a relative elevation. Down here at the bottom, you can watch this little man here, he'll give a distance of how far away we are. So see, I'm flying over the trees now. <laughs> I'll get over under that fence so you kind of see a fence. See, I've got a button here. <laughs> see, this is shooting out at an angle about 20 degrees. I don't know if you can see the gimbal angle right here. Uh, but here's, this is looking straight down, and this is looking totally flat, and so I need to turn my gimbal down. Oh, that's good. See, see the difference there? Straight down, and if I fly forward, you can see the grass, see over this, are, are those, are those grapevines or are those new trees? The first three trellises are new trees, the rest are grapes. Okay, so. Okay, I'm going to get some altitude so we can see what's going on. Yeah. See, I'm at 170, 180 feet. Wow. So that's 250 feet. <laughs> We're looking straight down. Okay, so here's just to kind of give you. Do a, a panorama going around in the circle. I'm stationary in one spot. Who's spotting for you, Steve? Now, now look at look at this field here. We're looking that direction. If I go, oh, uh, yeah, let me go back. Uh, see, see, we're looking at this side roll field. I'll go forward. Anybody see that in the sun? It's out there somewhere. No. No. Where's your spotter? Yeah, that's why, that's why you're all here. And, and this is this is what's really spooky about. Yeah. You know, it's 250 feet up, and it's up it, in the Steve. sun. So if I go forward, so you need a spotting scope. You can you never find it. Oh, you can't. No. You can work the spotting scope. Okay, see if I look straight down, see where I am now? I'm right over the fence. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay, look at, look at the side roll field. That's 250 feet. Wow. Somebody had a Mavic out here. Imagine trying to see that Mavic that's half that size. Yeah. Yeah, this is where, you know, we got to kind of think about some of this. Let me bring it back down. Hey, can, can we find our damn dogs with this thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Would you be yes. able to, if it was black, easier to see? Well, yes and no. All right. If you look at the field, see, see the green dots in the field? Can you see? drains that were leaking. This hasn't had water, I think, Katie said, for a month. But they're still wet. And those were drains or something leaking. 
So we're losing yeah. water. There. Yeah, we're just taking drains. extra water. But you know the perspective. See if I kind of go down on this. See these spots here. Yeah. Now, Gus, was, was this some of your dry trials? Yeah. Where'd Gus go? Where did Gus go? Gus. What's that? Oh, right, right there. there. Okay. <laughs> Do you know anything about the trials? See, like looking at fence lines. Some people okay. say you can check your fences this way. Okay. No, yeah, I think those might. Be I, I, you know, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, no, you got to walk your fences. Oh. Uh, Okay, I'm going to bring come down here. <laughs> see, okay, I'm looking straight down. You see where we're oriented now? We're right over this corner. I guess it's the other corner. Yeah. What about birds? Do birds just avoid this thing? Or? Sometimes they'll attack them. <laughs> yeah, yes and no. <laughs> it's the right bird to fly right into it. I've, I've, had, I've had hawks and stuff chase my RC airplane. <laughs> you know, try to take it out of the sky. I bet a bird take my plane out of the sky. Yeah. So you can kind of see the perspective that you get. And this is what we're, you know, we're interested in finding out. Anything else you want to see before I land this? Go see if you can see a difference in those two tree rows over there. Yeah, we're kind of like a steel. Yeah, we have to go in here. Yeah, 2500 bucks, I think that was a big one. I touched you those controls, Steve. I was thinking about it. Pretty touchy. How did you learn how to do this? Good question. Trial and error. <laughs> and see, these sticks are different than an RC airplane. Uh huh. And and so I get confused between the two of them, and I got to really think about it. Does one of those split the camera? I don't know. What's that? Those sticks. No. This is all drone. The camera is is run here, and like right here, that's a, taking a picture. See, that, that gives me the, I don't even see this yeah. focal point here. This is taking a still, and then this button here is for taking a video. So now, see the red? Okay, now I'm taking a video of it. Well, actually, you can do it the day before. Okay, Gus, what, what were you wondering? So these two rows, it tells you right in the middle game. The first two rows right there? Yeah. Yeah, they must Yeah. Yeah. Okay, see, I'm 37 feet elevation now from where we are. Okay, let me turn around. You want to look to the north? So you want to get back over those two rows? Those two rows. So what happened? I was gone for three weeks in the summer, and these, those two rows that you just flew over missed out on three weeks of water. And you could tell with the fruit quality, the fruit never sized up on them, and they were pretty stressed. Oh, of, of the trees, of the, the, trees the full grown trees. These yeah. Trees, those, those trees those there. Right there. Okay, see, now I, if I take and go straight down, here I am. Let me get over that row. See, I'm 37 feet high over that row. And let me fly down that row. See, that's a, you can't really see much looking straight down. Now, if I turn the gimbal,
So you can, in comparison to that row, going over a row, now is this your, okay, this is something else. Yep, and that's where we took some trees out there. So then we'll compare them to these two rows that didn't get killed. Right. Now I think from, <laughs> maybe with Blair with here, we might be able to see something a little different. Because this is all visible light, you know, what we can see, which is a small part of the spectrum. I do. So, what I'll do, I'm going to get some altitude here. We'll see. Okay, now if I push this button here, this is the return to home. We hope it is. Okay, see now it's going to go up to its preset altitude that I had of, I can't remember what it was, 100 meters, or 75 meters high or 50 meters high. Okay, see it's coming over and you set that so you can avoid any power lines or whatever. Everybody watch out. <laughs> Well, this is all automatic, right? This is automatic. <laughs> now it, 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 it locates itself by camera at this point. It's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 I still have control of it, so. But like the green flashing lights on the back tell me that it's got good satellites in the front. Is directional. And then it slows down. Once it gets close to the ground, it slows down and finds its spot. Round of applause. <laughs> Survived another one. <laughs> All drone pilots seem to feel that way when they put it back on the ground. <laughs> wow, I didn't crash. Just from your critical battery. Wow. I like that. Idea that Steve, do you have insurance? Steve, do you have insurance? I've crashed this one twice. Mm -hmm. Steve. And, you know, just little funky things like I didn't have the battery in tight. Uh, another one is like my solar panels. I just gotten it back from being repaired. <laughs> and they had put it in what they call an Addy mode, which is total free flight. And the mode I'm at right now is it flies 34 miles an hour as fast as it goes. If you take it into the sport mode or the Addy mode, it's like 45 miles an hour. But that's just like, yeah. it's just whipping so fast you can't do anything with it. Uh, do you have insurance? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the things. The insurance is about $1,500 a year minimum. It's, it's kind of pricey stuff. This is all part of, you know, where are we going to go with this? Where's the responsibility? If you're caught flying, like in a national park or whatever, it's a $30,000 fine. You know, if, if you crash, I was at Grand Junction watching JUCO ball games, and the TV station there was flying out in center field, crashed and missed the umpire by about five feet. Just lost total control. He's flying at night. Happened. My lights and another no-no as far as I'm concerned. But they're not foolproof by any means. They're, they're better. This this drone's like three years old. This is a Phantom Pro Plus that gives you this screen. A lot of them will use a use your phone or a tablet, and we can see what Blair's is doing. So, do you want to fly? Are you comfortable? Yeah, but the matrice will take time to process anyway. Okay. So the matrice is the big black one I had up there. It has a multi-spectral sensor on it as well as a thermal camera. And with the multi-spectral sensor, we'll go in and look at some of that. The academic portion of this day is coming up. And there will be testing at the end. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, I can't really fly it and show you anything. 
because I can do it at the field's edge, but it takes, after a while, it takes about three or four minutes to process it. So on the Matrice, I couldn't show anything right off the bat. Something tells me we're not going to be buying one like you have. Maybe not, unless you want to sell a new truck and buy a new one, which is how I got it. <laughs> so um, the other thing that this wonderful machine does, which is in the affordable realm for everybody, is you can set it, there are different pilot programs that you can use. And you can actually set up a grid map. What you're doing is you're looking through Google Maps or some other form through the monitor. And you pull up, it'll automatically, because it's GPS driven anyway, it'll automatically pull up where the drone is once you turn everything off. Then you draw what's called a geofence. And the reason I'm pointing, I'm not pointing at anybody, I apologize. Um, you draw a geofence on that monitor or on that monitor that he has. Okay, or on my iPad in my case. And that geofence will either take all the property lines or just a, sh a section or what a segment of your pasture and field and once you put in your parameters how much height you want how much altitude how much distance what your speed is going to be and then you also set what's called overlap which is this does that it doesn't overlap but it'll give you 80 percent more than if you're flying down a line it'll overlap 80 percent so you're getting a lot of different images, but they all connect. And this is similar to the photogrammetry question. And what it develops is called an orthomosaic, and we'll go into this more. But it will give you a number of vegetative analyses, uh, including fertilizer rates, variable rate uh, prescriptions, things like that. And it comes out of the processing unit that way. And it takes about two days to get that all processed. But as I said, on the field or in the field's edge, you can actually go out and ground truth with your agronomist, which I am not. I have an agriculture master's, but I'm not an agronomist, so I don't pretend to be. But you can go out with your agronomist or yourself and say, this is what we were seeing from 250 feet. Now here's what it's affecting. And we'll go in and look at all the maps and how that works. But uh, I can't fly the Matrice because you won't see anything. I can fly it and put it up in the air, but you're just going to stand here looking at it. I could do a mapping mission. I could go get my other one and do a mapping mission. But that depends on you. Uh, I know you probably all have busy schedules. It depends on how long you want to stay here. I could show you a mapping mission, but I'd like to see a show of hands for people who'd like to see that. If you want to just continue on with the presentation inside, give me a show of hands there. Yeah, if we could maybe even come out afterwards. Yeah. yeah. If, if, if we've got some time afterwards and fly around if you want. You know, after you see what he's, the information he's got, then maybe we can fly around afterwards and maybe we'll generate some more questions. For people who want to stay with that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a website called Drone Deploy. You can go on that. And there's a lot of information about, you know, loading on programs. They supply software. So, you know, you buy a drone, and then you buy a $7,000 infrared camera that goes hangs underneath it, and you go fly around, and then you got to buy software for 100 bucks a month, $75 a month, or whatever. There's some free software, like the mapping, you can download on there. But, you know, you can go... Yeah. On, uh, you know, keep going and going and going on this thing, and we've got to find the level that's practical for us. I've got to call in to, you know, see if there's been studies done on alfalfa. You know, can we use this on alfalfa? What can we get out of it? Or the beans and wheat, you got individual plants, and the beans and wheat is definitely, they know exactly. You can fly over it, and they can see rust in it. You can see nitrogen deficiencies, all that kind of stuff. But on alfalfa, I don't know what work's been done, but we'll, we're going to try to find out. And that's what we're trying to do today. I met many of you last year when I first started putting this together and said, I want to put this together. I want it to be a return on investment. I want it to be free if we can do it that way to at least some of your farms so we can get the data down. 
we don't know how well these things will work. So we're depending on you to say, well, try this, try this. Will it do that? Will it do something else? But you'll have maybe more questions after I do a short presentation. And so on. But we need your help. We want to make this a discussion, a talk. Skeptics, you're skeptical. Please throw out your skeptical questions. I want to hear from yeah. the devil's advocate. I really do, because that's the only way I can tailor this. It's the only way I can produce information and data that you all really need. No sense in me going out there and flying, whether we can do it on a grant or whether I do it for a small amount of money, because I am not charging much to farmers. So we can get out there and do it and take a look, but if it's not anything you need, why do it? You will read, if you've done any research on drones and on NDVI and NDRE and all the different vegetative indexes, you'll see there's a lot of information and sometimes it doesn't match up. So that is one concern I want to throw out there. If you start researching these drones and you find yourself 30 hours later staring into your computer screen because you get hooked on it, but you say, wait a minute, this company doesn't match this one, this information doesn't match that, it's okay. It only takes a year to get it straightened out. But uh, that's what we're going to try yeah. to do. Well, let, yeah, let's head inside and, and see what, uh, what Blair's got, and then we can kind of get some discussion. I'd like to, you know, if people need to leave at noon to get most of this presentation done. We have one question here. In that whether it matches up, it seems to me that it has, that what that's doing needs to make sense with what we see here. Yes, precisely. It has to make sense. And when you go into companies like Drone Deploy, or who I'm thinking of using called Agrobotics, um, they have that processing down. The full processing all the way through. So you and what we'll do is we'll ground truth it. We'll have the agronomist go out and do tests on it and find out exactly did we see up there what's going on down here? And will it most importantly limit the amount of inputs you have to put in and increase the outputs? That's the name of the game. Well, and that's what we're trying to do. You know, one of the exciting things is you can measure moisture content in plants. So you can see what's, I mean, what you're looking at is what's stressed. And then he's trying to figure out why is it stressed? Is it water? Is it nutrients? What is it? So you're trying to find stress. David and I were talking about flying over trees. And you can see pest infestations and stuff. And it's a color change. But well, I won't take his thunder away. Oh, you yeah. I don't have any anyway. <laughs> so let's, let's mosey in. We probably ought to get this out of the way. Yeah. Portion of this presentation, you'll be glad to know I only have 12 slides, so I can't go on and on and on. But I want to thank all of you who were here last year um, when Katie had the meeting. I want to thank you all for coming back, even after listening to my crazy idea back then. Because I didn't really know, I knew where I wanted to go with this, but I wasn't absolutely sure. And I'm still not what we need to provide for you. And so that's what we want to figure out now, partially today, and over time. Dipper, is it this one? Yeah, it, if you use the, uh, the wheel, you go to the next one. Okay. Let me start with this slide. What we have is visual camera or an RGB similar to what Steve was flying today. Which is red, green, blue. Red, green, blue is what it stands for. This is taken off of a camera, a 20 megapixel camera. It can, it, you can take the P4P or the Phantom 4 Pro or Plus or Advantage or any of those Phantom 4s and you can create models, you can do grid flying, and you can create a number of the pictures that we've got coming up in here. For instance, this one could come off of that camera. It's all in how the processing is done. Now in here, these two are the same fields. This field is showing us striations. We don't know what that's from. Is it irrigation? Is it some kind of uh, infestation? Is it some lacking mineral we don't know? So then we come down here with a different processing program and we get what's known as an NDVI. 
VI picture. Now, NDVI is a vegetation index. It tells us basically where we have healthy plants, where we have unhealthy plants, where we might have weeds, where we might have sparse ground. This is in five different levels. Each one of these, these grids is either one meter, ten meters, or five meters in a different place. What that does is it allows you to use a variable rate prescription throughout here because it's GPS loaded. These things are telling you this color here, for instance, the red, let me see if I've got my palette right in my head, is going to be areas of weaker vegetation. When you start getting into these different colors, you start getting into healthier vegetation. Now, if we go forward, oh, it worked. Where? How large was that field? Do you know? I don't. I don't. This is all coming from a company that I'm thinking of using for processing called Agrobotics. So I didn't want to bring up my flights because, frankly, I don't have clear enough images yet. I wanted to bring these up that are absolutely pristine images so you can see really what is produced. Now, with a normalized difference vegetation index, we can see plant vigor, differences in soil water availability, foliar nutrient content. We don't read the soil yet. Although I'm looking into, with agrobotics, looking into getting a penetration probe so I could actually take the drone and fly into different areas and do soil sampling. But that may be still down the road quite a ways. Now, it also will give you yield potential. And you can do this at different times of the season to just get a visual overall health of what is going on with your fields. It will give you above ground biomass, how much vegetation is coming up. And it works best early on. When plants, when it's green up, when it's a little bit beyond that, when they, plants are starting to really show themselves. I am not a farmer. I want to make that really clear. I wish I had been at certain times. Um, and I still want to get out into this area more. I live outside of Durango. But one of the things I would really want to say to you is you've got to help me. I want to give you the best service I can. So I, as I sit out there, I need the skeptics. I need the devil's advocates. I need the people who say, this is going to work wonderfully. Or we don't see the benefit. Please be honest, open, ask me questions, statements, anything you've got right now. Now, NDVI is followed up by NDRE, which is basically a way, there it is, NDRE will also look at nitrogen foliar content, but it will do it later on in the season. So once you've got a lot of vegetation and biomass up, you can use this type of processing program um, because of the connections between chlorophyll, nitrogen, fertilizer demand, things like that. So, but again, I want to stress, everything we are looking at needs to be ground truth. It's the best way to get out there and say, yep, that's what we saw and that's what's going on. All right, this is a composite layer, color infrared. Did we go beyond the, I didn't see it up there. Beyond the, uh, the spectral analysis? No, no. I go through, I think you've got one slide of, of visible light versus mm -hmm. the near red, mm -hmm. infrared. Yeah. I'm a little beyond that, I think. Okay. Then you're beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how to back this up? Uh, I think. I'm going to give you a very quick education that's as I know it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Back up one more? Yeah, you're backing up. See, that's the center pivot there. Just for... Right. For, is this the one you want? Go one, one more. One more. Yeah. Okay, one more. That's it. Okay. Thank you. How does this work? What? Why do colors have any impact on what you're growing? Well, there's two reasons. One, we look at the infrared spectrum. And the infrared spectrum will show us what's going on in our plants 14 days before the human eye will see it. 
It's one of the big benefits of this drone application. Mm -hmm. If you can see anything, any of the diseases you can think of, anything that's going to impact your plants and your crops, this will pick it up in time. The trick is to make sure to get out and fly it on a fairly regular basis. Four times in a season is probably all you would need to fly. Uh, but for the inspections, you'd want to do it on a regular basis, the kind of things you were talking about, Steve. Yeah, yeah, there's two. Yeah, go ahead. I won't interrupt. No, please do. Well, it's like, it's the scouting, the, the inspections, visually of what I did. That's one layer. And then the next layer is this precision ag layer where we're going beyond what's visible to the eye. So that this gives you the, the academic, the scientific side behind it. Okay, what, what does my crop need? Because a stressed plant is reflecting a different color of light that we're not seeing. The green on a plant is what, that, the green light is reflected off of the plant when it's healthy. So we see green. But this is seeing more colors. Make okay. sense? Thanks. Here's what we see in the visible spectrum. And all of electromagnetic radiation takes up all this other bit. And you can't see that very well, but we are at 0.6 nanometers. Don't need to know that for the test. Uh, actually, between 0.4 and 0.7 nanometers. And it goes up to 20. So that can give you a sense of how little we see. Just a very small amount. Whereas the thermal picks up a lot more. How do we bring this back, Steve? Uh, yeah. We, yeah, probably hit next here. Get out of that. That's freezing you up. Yeah, it is. Okay. All right. Color is made up of spectral signatures. Everything, the glass, the boards, me, you, even Steve. <laughs> the colors that we see reflected, such as the green that you were talking about, that color characteristic is known as a spectral signature. And it is true in every single thing on Earth. Plants take it down even further and they have their own spectral signatures. In the spectral signature, again, this is what we're seeing. The blue, the green, and the red. We can't see any more than that. But once we get into the near infrared, that's where spectral signatures really start talking to us. Because if we have a spectral signature that we know is supposed to be riding up in here, and I say we know because it's through the processing, but we know it should be up in this area and it's falling down here somewhere, if that's what we're seeing in our crops, then what we have is unhealthy vegetation. Again, just another way to look at it. This is how this works. It's all based on color. If we take it another step, and I think I'm going to go into this, yeah. Okay, healthy, ve healthy vegetation reflects a high level of near-infrared energy and it appears red in this layer. This layer will help us find variability in soil, mo soil moisture and assessing soil composition. It also helps us to identify water bodies. Now on the drone I use on this one, this right here is a thermal camera. This thing, let's see if I can get this up, This underneath is the spectral camera. It's a multi-spectral camera. It, takes, it has five different lenses on it. Red, blue, green, which we see back up in those other graphics. And then it picks up what's called red edge and then near infrared. And that's where we're seeing the different colors. In this particular palette of colors, this is set up such that it gives you soil variability. Am I okay there? Ooh, thank you. Whoops. Yeah. Thanks, um, As you can see here, unhealthy vegetation appears as washed out pink tones and uh, color infrared. And we know that we've got vegetation here that's just not quite where it needs to be. 
And then you can also see what your soils are doing <coughs> in this kind of situation. Oh, I'm sorry, did I really mess you up? Sorry. You're good. You're good. All right, soils will depend on, soil color depends on the composition, whether it's clay, loamy, sandy, and it will give you those different color variations. So you get a sense of what's going on in your soil uh, layer and composition. So is that bottom left corner a road with weeds in it? Or yes. Okay. Uh -huh, exactly. I was wondering if somebody would pick that up. Please, go ahead. Leaving aside cost for the moment, mm -hmm. do the FAM 4s allow you to fit some of these other uh, cameras on them, or, or is that restricted to higher end units? That's a good question, because I looked into doing that. You can buy kits. Don't get fooled into this. You can buy kits, a thermal camera or a multi-spectral, that will fit on the bottom of the Phantom 4, like what Steve was flying earlier. Problem is payload. It's too heavy. You can get it off the ground, but then that battery. wobble yep. that you get that Steve was talking about earlier is not leveled out, so you don't get good images. In a 10-acre plot, for instance, I took 288 images in about 7 minutes. Now, these images were all of pasture and field, but the first time I took it, I couldn't get them to process correctly, and it's because I had too much not enough overlap, as I was talking about out there. You have to set the parameters just right. But that's a whole other thing that <coughs> we're not here to discuss today too much. But we can take these. Now, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Bob. Bob. What we can do is we can take this into another computer program, and we can build three-dimensional maps. Or we can do what's called elevation maps, or DSM. With those elevation maps, you can find the best water courses on your property or in your fields. You can identify where it's going to flow the best, and you can identify your moisture content. That is true of a number of these different types of maps, and I'm throwing these up just simply because they are the ones that are used most often. There are a number of different, let's call them algorithms, that do the processing that will create many more maps. I'm sure a lot of it is nothing you need. So I've picked out what I think will give you the most information. Okay, here we have one that is Optimized Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index. Well, what the heck does that mean? Maps variability in the canopy density. This works very well on sparse vegetation and on being able to look at soils, being able to tell where your healthier vegetation is as opposed to your weaker vegetation. And this is your road that you were talking about, right here, it's a different color palette. All of these can be changed depending on what you need. All right, this is the digital surface map. This is probably, if we were going to do a flight on somebody's farm, and we need to create a base of information, that's probably the biggest thing we can do, is get a year's baseline of analysis. We would start with this. We would say, how's your water? How's your irrigation? How's your elevation? What's it, what's it causing? What is it doing? So we model the water flow and accumulation. We can identify everything Steve is talking about, but to a greater impact. So we, basically what this does is it drills down even further for those people who want to really get every return on investment dollar that they can out of it. That's the trick. So the deeper we can get, the more information we can get. Are there any agronomists in here? You are great? Great. I need to talk to you. <laughs> okay. Oh, it didn't all come up. That's interesting. <laughs> Maybe it's down here. Oh. Oh, it's a split slide? Yeah, I didn't know I did that. All right. 
So what the heck can we do with this? Well, we can do immediate ground truthing. Within just a matter of three to five minutes with agrobotics, we can generate a map in the field at the field's edge. It's not the greatest map, it's not the highest resolution map, but it tells you where you need to go ground truth and what's going on with it. Once that is done, while well, you're ground truthing, I am processing. And then we have the information that we know where to go, what to do, what nutrients, what variable prescription rates. But it takes it a step further. It creates what's called a shape file. That shape file will go into your farming management platform. It will be utilized to identify all of those little matrix that we saw at the beginning and all of those squares it will identify how much of what needs to go into there. So what we're coming down to is with Steve's information and what we've got here is we are trying very much to increase the ROI. What can we do with this? We don't know. We don't know. I can throw out lots of statistics and say, oh, you're going to get $15 more per acre for a bushel of corn. Or you're going to get $20 more for your soybeans. I don't know that. But I'd like to help you figure that out. And together with High Desert, and perhaps we can start moving forward, on some of these analyses. I have a long way to go. I need to get better. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hide that. And even though I am a business owner, I'm not here to sell you anything. If you want something, come talk to me. But other than that, I am still on a mission, and I don't know if I ever told you that before, to get this done so we can see you grow, see you prosper, and get through this time that's so difficult for us. Yes, please. You keep talking variable precision, mm -hmm. and I assume you're talking water and fertilizer? Primarily. How many people have the capability of variable rate application on a grid like you just showed versus a management zone? I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, I'll guarantee there's not many people here can afford a variable rate applicator for fertilizer. Okay. Yeah, then that means that what I need to do is look at in the management zones and see how we can create it that way. That, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that up because that definitely is some of the information we need. Well, and, and I think part of it might be, you know, helping with application dates and quantities, you know, you know, some of the pivots, you know, they've got injectors on. But I think, you know, for a dry application or whatever, I'm wondering if this will tell us, okay, this is a good time to do it, or we need more nitrogen, less nitrogen, we wasted our nitrogen. Some of this, like, did did we did we get too much overlap in our, you know, if you're running your tractor off of GPS, and, you know, you said, okay, I'm going 60 foot, between my passes or whatever, did we get the overlap? Was I going too fast, too slow? That's what I'm wondering about, like that tiger striping in that one field, is, you know, is this going to help us determine some of that stuff so we can get the most benefit out of our application? Are you sure it wasn't wind affecting the well, water pattern? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variables in there. I mean, you know, it's the terrain, everything, and I don't know. But I, I, it's, it's worth trying to find out. Yeah. Steve, just, I think one of my key interests is um, water application uniformity. And a lot of times there's maybe not something you can do about it, but in a long term strategy, it's sort of nice to identify. And I think the wind strips on side rolls are, you know, very obvious to most people. And, certain things we've battled with, but on the pivots I'm noticing a little bit of a different problem. That you get three kinds of alfalfa. 
stuff that's too wet, stuff that's right, and stuff that's too dry. And I've walked fields for miles and miles, and I've said, you know, I've got 20% of this that's too dry on the crowns of the hills, and I've got 15% that's too wet in the ravines, and the rest of it looks great, but is there anything I can do about it? And I don't know which spectrum would, at least in alfalfa, maybe bring out those three different colors, or those three different areas, but I, you know, that's a specific thing that I throw out and saying, okay, you know, which camera collecting data from which spectrum and which post-processing is going to give the best picture of irrigation uniformity or disuniformity on alfalfa. And I know I'm getting crop specific and just no water thing here, but th that's probably the best one thing that I would throw out from my own interests. Well, I, I think if we know where it is, I mean, the, the, map, the basic map to start with, that we can recognize, yeah, we do have these problems of knowing where they are, and then it's like, are, are we looking at different nozzle packages and then being able to interpret that without having to walk the field. Well, I, I, I don't know. I think if you could get a good picture of a field and talk about how much is too wet and how much is too dry and start to quantify it, then you can start to make the arguments of, you know, does it pay to try and correct that? And how might you correct and improve the uniformity? Um, but you kind of need to know what percentage of the field is getting watered right and what fraction of it's dry and what fraction is wet. But I, I'm, I'm guessing there's one of those spectrums that would, uh, you know, the too wet alfalfa is a little lighter green. The too dry alfalfa is sort of faded and... What, what do you think? Yes. There's two ways to approach that. Um, for water management, you can use a thermal camera, not for the water. What we've been talking about mostly is the multi-spectral sensor. But the thermal camera, when it sits on, on the left side, of, left side of that for you right now, will identify moisture-laden areas within your fields, or the circle that you're watering with, or whatever it might be. So it will not only do that, but it will show the intensity of the moisture. Then you take the multi-spectral camera, which is flying and shooting at the same time. You can make both of them operate at the same time. It will then tell you in a color palette, just like what you're talking about, what is getting the most water based on the health of the plant. What's getting the right amount of water and what's getting too little. And probably the NDVI on the spectrum is one of the first things to look at. It's the simplest, it's the quickest, and it gives you the kind of the down and dirty. And then from there you go into other things. But that's something we want to investigate. And we don't, I personally do, I would come out and do some of these investigations and maybe charge you for gas. I, I'm curious about all this. I, I... From what you've seen on that moisture, on the moisture end of it, is it reflecting actual true moisture or is it reflecting different characteristics of soil or different characteristics of plant communities because typically That's where you get a lot of water <clears throat> you'll see a species shift and you won't have your alfalfa growing. You might see more grasses and sedges or something in there or weeds or whatever. Right. And and so is it... I'm, I'm not sure on what, what it's picking up on. Is it is it with these thermal cameras and the, the other one that you talked about, is it actually somehow quantifying the amount of water there? Or is it it's really just keying into plant health and reflecting certain spectrums, right? Right. The latter of what you just said. The thermal camera will give you moisture content. It's, it's, it's actual moisture. But the other one bases it off of what's going on with the, 
And so as you shift species, does that give you false readings? I mean, as like if you had grass here and alfalfa alpha here? Or even a weed somewhere yeah. growing up, a patch of weeds. Yeah. It will in the color palette, depending on how it's set. But generally, it's going to take ground truthing to get out there and say, we knew there was a problem here. Mm -hmm. And instead of real healthy vegetation, we have real healthy weeds. But it will point that out. It can't tell you what type of invasive weed you might have, mm -hmm. but it will identify different areas of heavier vegetation versus light. That's just very top. That's a 30,000. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So you collect data, you do some post-processing. Mm -hmm. What about the idea of once you're starting to see a picture with some variability on it, going right back out to the field and on the ground going to those different color areas and saying, yeah, I'm going to connect this color with overwatered alfalfa and this color with underwater and, and you know, customizing and, it that way. The places we can definitely see weeds or species change, you know, we're not we're either seeing or not seeing a correlation with the process data. But, you know, it, it, it seems like, you know, it's, it's almost, in that mode, almost a research tool of saying, yeah, we're going to put a bunch of man hours into collecting and processing a bunch of data and then trying to go out and physically transect the ground and see what the image correlates to it, you know, right. on foot, you know, reading to... Um, you know, just validate and confirm or unconfirm the picture, so to speak. If I'm responding correctly to what you've just said, I would say that's exactly why we're here. We want to confirm what these things are telling us, and are they telling us anything that makes sense? We believe they are, but it's going to take agronomists, it's going to take crop consultants, it's going to take yourself, knowing your land probably better than anybody else, to go out there and say, okay, that was that, was that spot that showed up on NDVI. And instead of healthy plants, I've got those healthy weeds. Or you've got some other infestation <coughs> disease. And that's where the agronomist kicks in, or crop and so on. With that, ground truth. With ground truth. Yeah. That's a, we got to put that up in neon lights. Ground truth. It's got, I, I go ahead. <laughs> but, but you know where to go, and I think you know where to go. It, it's time to me. Time is the important thing. You know, can we save time? Because that time's money. You know, if if you're changing fifteen side rolls. You know, you don't have time. Can, can we do this, get some analysis, and then, then go double check it, go ground truth it, and say, okay, we need to go to side roll 16, and, and we've got something wrong there, or that part of the field is, is not getting it. Or, you know, do we need to change some of our irrigation patterns of... You know, do we need, if, we, if it's possible, speed our pivot up, slow it down. You know, we fly this and saying, okay, yeah, we can wait a day or two, or no, we need to speed it up. But we can get this information quickly. Some of these programs are, uh, inst I mean, almost instant. I mean, it takes three minutes for it to process it. We don't, I don't think we have to send it off to Kansas City to have it analyzed. I think it's, it's real-time imaging, and that's kind of what I'm thinking, that if we can get some real-time data that, you know, even if it takes a day to find out, mm -hmm. we're ahead of the game, because if, if we're seeing this two weeks before, if the, the near-red is seeing it two weeks before we can see it, it gives us a chance to jump on it. Like do, is it worth fertilizing? Do I need more water? I don't know. I, I, you know, 
This is all brand new to me. I, I would looking at, oh, go ahead, John. <laughs> looking at it from an agronomy standpoint, I don't know if there's just my my general feeling is I don't know if there's a lot of a, availability to do active management within a single season, unless you're growing some annual crops. But maybe it would provide information over a period of time that shows, you know, well, my grass was, or my alfalfa was stressed in the same spot year after year, and oh, in this one year it wasn't. What did I do different in that year? Uh, did I start the pivot earlier? Did I, did I, were the weather conditions different? Did I cut later? Did I cut sooner? I think it might identify things like that where you could get yield production. Um, just by changing your management. Um, I am skeptical around here in this community of the types of crops we grow, what, what the benefits are in an active management system for a year, but maybe they could give some historic prep. If you can tie that back to some kind of coincidence, well, that's when we had a drought, and, or I, it looks better this year, and I got better yields that year, and I cut I cut earlier or whatever, and it, it showed me plant health. I, I'm not sure. It, it seems yeah. like it's going to be really hard to make some of those correlations to me. I, you want to take that? No, go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 my, my processing. Yeah. No. Okay. I'm, I'm not near you know, real time processing. <laughs> Joel? Mm -hmm. um, yes, to just sort of say, state my agreement. Mm -hmm. We need to have a baseline. We need to have a year's baseline, um, at least do our research and experimentation stage to find out what these things do. Uh, here is going to be tougher. Most of the studies have been done in flat states, Kansas, Iowa, places like that. And they're, they're accurate studies, they're statistically, statistically provable, but they're as Steve has pointed out to me time and time again, they're not what we have out here. It's not the same soil conditions, it's not the same wind conditions, it's not the same rolling hill conditions. So, um, I, I, I can share your skepticism. Um, that's the only way we can make this work, if it works, is by sharing skepticism. Well, I'm not necessarily skeptic. It, it is just I'm just trying to find out where the value is. I mean, it's obvious that they it provides some some quality information, but how can we put that information to use it, in the crops we have? And right. That's where I'm I'm struggling. One of the big ways is to identify. And let's just take nitrogen and fertilizer. Instead of putting so much fertilizer, x amount on 500 acres, you identify where your 100 acres are that need it. So you've already broken it down by, or already limited your costs. That's what we're shooting for, is that kind of thing. Does that help at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, excuse me, I had a gentleman right back here, Bob. Yes, please. Where the real benefit of this is, is flying the three to four times a year and looking for the stress and figuring out what's causing that stress. Mm -hmm. Whether it's weed pressure, insects, disease, a plug sprinkler, mm -hmm. those are all fixable. Mm -hmm. And we can increase yield if we catch it quick enough. Yes. Yeah, it's like that, you know, the, the nozzles that were plugged on that center tube. You can see you've got a circumference that's eight feet wide or whatever over. You know, that circumference is a thousand feet. Well, you've lost a quarter of an anchor. You know, I mean, those are that, and that's where breaking this down into this visual, you know, the short term, this is I'm kind of processing what Joel said is that short term analysis and the long term, you know, to where, okay, we can start, you know, managing our water better on the long term. You know, immediately we can fix errors that. Okay, we got a plug sprinkler. I didn't have to walk for a half an hour to go find that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's to me is big. Mm -hmm. But then looking at our fertilizer application, and, and two weeks ago I was in South Central Minnesota, in the middle of you know, it was soybean, 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 Lutheran Church, soybeans, <laughs> water, you know, Lutheran Church, 
And I mean, that's just such incredible farm country compared to ours. And this is where learning, trying to figure out how we can adapt this to us, right. and and is it worthwhile? I know, Gus, you had a... Well, you know, I think uh, one thing I keep coming back to with, with this whole thing is the the analysis mm -hmm. of, of this photography whenever you're coming back through. there's The analysis plays such a role in the map that you get. You know, you can have this done, you can get a pretty map back, but I think the ground truth thing, as you say, is so important with that. The other thing, too, is a question I have is whenever you're doing this, say you're, you're flying field, the one cloud that's in the sky shows up, runs a shadow across the area. That, that data is history as far as I'm concerned, right? You pretty well have to start all over because that's going to really change. All of a sudden, you're going to see a strip in the field. You're going to go, what happened here? There's nothing going on. It was just a cloud that passed by and changed that reflection. Right. And now you're dealing with a whole other level of complexity. You brought up a great point, Gus. And the camera adjusts for that, or the multispectral sensor does. Prior to doing any flight, we have to do what's called a reflectance test with this machine. And it's based on a reflection board, and we take three or four shots, and then it will adjust the reflection reflectance based on what's going on in the atmosphere. Another, another point, does it work? We'll find out. We didn't have a single cloud over our field. Well, I, I was just going to say, I'm not just going to have a problem with that. No. <laughs> Katie? Yeah, so my question when I think about return on investment and some of these other things, mm -hmm. I've been a little out of the technology development for a while, but I know on a small scale in research, you have to use an infield check strip. And at least this was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, what level are these computer processing programs evolving? The agrobionics, is that what the word Agrobotics. Is? Agrobotics. Mm -hmm. You know, what scale are some of their calibration points so that you don't have to ground truth in every single field? So from, particularly from like a fertility or water stress management standpoint, there's been a ton of research on these multispectral indices all over the U.S. and I just wonder how much those programs have evolved to, to utilize it so that we could use it on say like a regional scale that you're not going back and, and stepping on every single person's field if you're using a fertility prescription for instance you know like we should be to that point I would imagine that they're pretty well evolved that you could say okay I took your field and we're going against these calibration coefficients that are scaled for you know maybe a, a low nitrogen stress to high nitrogen stress you know mm -hmm. how, how do you how do you see some of that computer technology evolving to, to get a better return on investment? Because if you're still having to walk the fields and we're growing wheat, you know, it's going to be, that's going to be a pretty, you got to have a pretty good return on investment at that point. That's a big question. <laughs> um, leave it to these academics to ask a question to answer. Um, I don't know the full answer to that. But what I have seen is drones right now, the drone industry is kind of like the Wild West. They're all vying for position, all the big guys, the processing companies, the manufacturers, the software guys. And they're all pushing to build these algorithms and coefficients and so forth and so on. Stuff I don't understand because I, I just don't get into that part of it too much. But they are actively working on this stuff. Um, ten years ago, I don't know the technology from back then, but I'd like to talk to you afterwards to see if I can clarify that a little bit more. I just wondered if, like, because you have to buy into that programming equipment, correct? Correct. So I wondered if they were having anything in their sales information to say, okay, <clears throat> we feel 95% confident that our imaging equipment will process your, your, your images and tell you that when we say, okay, this this uh, bean field is deficient in this area, that you're not then spending extra money on fertilizer, you know? that So that's what I'm thinking of, is that okay. how calibrated is that processing software to know that what you're then applying in a prescription sense is actually calibrated well? I feel like it should be there, I don't know. I mean, um, there's a lot of research on this stuff from now we're in 15, 20 years. You know, it's not yesterday. So I just wondered if anything from that, from these processing um, software companies, if they have any type of 
I, I was confidence. You know, I yeah, mean, my my do. thing in this is like weeks old on this technical side of it, this academic side. And I was looking like at this drone deploys website, and and there's some of the software is free, and some of it like the mapping software you download on your phone, the, the receiver, in. and then they they had 75 different wraparound programs from John Deere and from Ag Science and all this kind of stuff. These people fighting for that piece of the pie, mm -hmm. you know, of download this this software to find this. I mean, there were 75 different ones listed, and this is just drone deployed, and and so th this is growing very quickly. You know, I think from ten years from now, ten years ago now is, is, you know, you know we've reached the industrial revolution on, on the drone thing, and you know they've become to where the drones. The good thing about them is they're almost autonomous to fly. You know, you can set up programs in it to fly one thing or another, waypoints in it. Like you can set it up, you know, here, fly a straight line that way, follow. My, my center pivot to the center, and you don't have to worry about flying, I can look at the imaging. And, and so that's changed quite a bit, and I think these, I mean, it, it's changing week by week. If that helps any. Uh, I'm Bob, I'm trying to take everybody in order, and I apologize. Yeah, I, I'm just curious, um, we've mentioned a couple applications that seem like they're suited to just regular spectrum imaging. Uh, in other words, you can detect blood sprinklers, you can start getting some plant stress health. I'm curious, I, I'm interested in photogrammetry and creating accurate contour data. Um, are there other applications that we can get to with a Phantom 4 that we don't have to try to look at, you know, thermal imaging with? But, but are within our grasp with just a standard Phantom 4. Are there other areas you can think of that, that are clearly available to us at that level? <laughs> no. <laughs> Your turn. You I'm were on. processing, I'm, weren't I'm you? I'm processing. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, there, you can create uh, a number of maps similar to what we're looking at today off of Phantom 4, you can do it. And what might be the, I mean, I know that uh, there are a number of programs that are available for free, and then there's some, I was looking at Drone Mapper up in Cedar Edge, for example, that allows you to do some very high definition photogrammetry, but are there, are there freebies out there that you'd recommend with the Phantom 4? Uh, I, I couldn't answer that. Okay. Maps I, I, made easy. Is a freebie, um, and it's also connected with a company called Drones Made Easy. I'm not sure about I'm sure about the maps part, and I'm sure about the drone part, but I'm not sure about the Made Easy part. Because okay. <laughs> you have, if you want to do contour, I've just been wrestling with this myself. If you want to do contour maps, you can bring them down to one foot intervals, mm -hmm. flying from under 400 feet. And with a, with a confidence of probably 98% in that kind of case, mm -hmm. very high confidence. They get it within one centimeter of accuracy. You have to go as, you, you've got, as Gus and I were talking earlier, you have to process in different ways. The freebies, will work, they will do contours, but you also have to jump into th such programs as QGIS. And that's where it starts getting tough. There's one of the reasons I'm going with agrobotics, and I'm quite sure I'm going that way, is they do only one thing. They do agriculture analysis. A lot of companies like Drone Deploy do everything. Right. Roof inspections, everything down the line. Um, but I want somebody who knows agriculture and just says, this is what we've got. And you can utilize a PE4 for that, family. Four. for that, for photogrammetry, orthomosaics. And the Mavics, the Mavics won't do that, right? I'm sorry. The Mavic 
models. We got to go Phantom Four or Three to, to get there. Is that my? Is that? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure familiar with that. I've just dug into the the Mavic Pro, the Mavic Pro for that. Um, that's more of the higher end, pro, like the Phantom Pro Four Pro. And yeah, Platinum. They're, they're constantly coming out new drones. Okay. And, and this Phantom Four, it's we're kind of quoting a high price, I think. In well, yeah, it's by the time you buy a few batteries and yeah. some extra yeah. pops and you, know, <laughs> and case, you do you need, that kind of stuff and the charger mm -hmm. and the, you know yeah. whatever you need, you can go on Amazon and it'll go you know fourteen ninety nine ninety five, but then you got you know one hundred sixty five bucks for batteries and you need some of those and you need some props and you need this and you want lenses mm -hmm. you want. I mean, you can put on yeah, polarizing person. lenses. Yeah. I mean, there's a variety of stuff, but you'll spend two grand. Okay. Yeah, the, the Mavic is more of a, not the lower end, but it's just more compact end. Maybe you can't carry them with them. There's some additions, but everybody in Japan is saying, oh, we can throw it on there and fly your drone. Well, then it's too heavy. Your battery time goes cut in half because of your payload. So, yeah. but there's a lot of depth. There's a lot of things you can put on a Phantom 4 of having those arms that hang down floating inside so you do land, it doesn't smash up your camera. Mm -hmm. David, did you have a question? I don't have one here. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. So, uh, presumably when it's taking those transects across the field, it's taking still images that it stitches together. Yes. Um, and to do that, you need a certain amount of overlap to make sure you get all the information. Right? Correct. So, there's a lot of like distortions that can happen over the course of the flight pattern, would it be like it flying a diagonal because of the wind or what yeah, have you? Yeah. Um, I'd be concerned about the amount of precision when trying to relate that map to, say, nitrogen requirements or something like that. Because once you're converting this, the still images to like a NDVI, mm -hmm. um, it's smoothing over and averaging out those pixel um, uh, values. Yeah. So you're getting kind of, you're not getting 100% exact what the soil needs. It's averaging and blending together a little bit on the edges, depending on the amount of distortion. <coughs> so, like, do kind of along the same lines. Like, these companies that are processing information, do they? Talk about that? Do they talk about how much distortion they got in those images? They or? do. Okay. They have technical sheets that you can go into and find out what their distortions are, what they require, uh, things like that. They have all their technical information available. And that's a good point. I wanted to find a program that would not only provide instantaneous, while you're flying, data but would also provide really good, rigorous, vigorous, robust information that you can use. You can't get both in the same package. You can get one that will, three or four minutes after the flight, you can process it and get a low resolution map that will give you ideas of where to ground truth. Or you can get, and that one will give you the most robust information, that processing software. If you go to, and I've looked at Drone Deploy a lot for this, if you go to Drone Deploy, they have all kinds of pretty things. They really do. And Drone Deploy, I'm still considering them. They will do a live mapping. While you're flying, it's mapping, it's doing everything. But the reports that you get as the client, as the concerned farmer, they're just not as robust. They're not as good. They don't give you that confidence level. They don't give you the real tight information that you need for that specific piece of ground. So what you're saying all depends on the software program or two and processing algorithm. I think there was yes, sir, one right ahead of you. I'm kind of a simple guy, more than a lot of you here. We have used grid sampling, zone sampling, uh, yield mapping, variable rates for years. Mm -hmm. Somebody was talking about water. Maybe, maybe Steve brought it up. In our instance, you can do everything right, 
if you haven't caught a problem with the water, it, the rest of it doesn't mean a thing. Yeah, that's, that's so true. The reason we bought a drone, and it is, you talk about return on investment, it's more than paid for itself. The $2,000 is new. For what good it does. Really comes um, down our pilot's down. back here, maybe he can comment. He's been doing it this year. <laughs> but you can go out and you can take a few minutes, take some, fly over some pivots, because I guarantee if there's a plug nozzle, four days from now it's too late. You've lost the chrome. Mm -hmm. You've got to be have, and that's been the problem. We've had uh, infrared stuff from satellites for years and years. And I'm, they're getting better. I'm getting some now, uh -huh. which are good for a lot of this. Uh, still pays. You can't get away from spot check and walk in the field, but you're never going to get away from that if you're in agriculture and farming. Mm -hmm. But still, every one of these things you're talking about is another tool in your toolbox. Mm -hmm. We will probably never go beyond this, but for what we needed was an instant visual. It's just like going out in the sprayer. You can see in your field more than you can walk in the ground. And this, this enables us to, we got three batteries so we can fly 45 minutes, isn't that why it's gone? Yeah. <laughs> but he can be back in and you can be looking at this within a couple, three hours of when he took the pictures and you can make that decision. You can send people to that pivot to do better. <clears throat> because without the water, we don't have nothing. Well, we we all, all the stuff, stuff, all the fancy stuff, and we've been doing it. But we were still short that ability to take care of the water issue on the pivot in a timely manner. And if you wait too long, you've lost it. You've lost it. Yeah, you can't bring it back. So water's, <coughs> water's everything, <coughs> guys. That's where Steve's, you know, what he was talking about earlier really fits in. And as you may know, um, and as your pilot may know, and probably has, you can set those up so you just fly a routine flight. Yeah, we're still getting better, aren't we? Stop. Yeah. <laughs> we're it takes time. I just wanted to add, add to that. I was listening to all, all of this. I think it really comes down to water. A little bit I've been doing out at our farm, just testing. That's when the sun's at noon, looking straight up. You're looking down at pivot early in the season. You can see just the light tan, and you can see the dark where your sprayers are hitting. You can see how far they're reaching, how fast it's moving, what looks light, what looks bad. Then come down, look through the reflection of the sun coming through, seeing how far your water's shooting out. Mm. And then you can just tag it, okay, six in, I gotta go out and change that nozzle or turn it up, turn it down, or put a bigger one, whatever it is. I think that's what I don't know if that's what most of the people are looking at, but that's what I look for is where's that water strain. Yeah, and and, and, and that may be all that anyone here needs. In a perfect world, nozzles never plug. Right. <laughs> but what's just as bad is a partial plug, and you can't see it from your picture. Yeah, you're going to hill and pivot some. But if you're pivot. if you fly in it and take a look, you can see that there's an issue there, and pretty soon you can tell within one day if it hasn't been watered, you can tell the difference on the crop. Yeah. So do you fly yours on a regular basis, like uh, like every week or something? Not regular or enough. We're getting better. But yeah. We had it two years ago and we used it sparingly. This year we've done a lot better. It needs to happen every. You need to cover the farm every week if you're doing a water assessment. And we just did one the other day after the water's been off, and we're going back to nature, you know, because we shut off early. And you can see over these alfalfa fields every place that there was an issue throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see showing up now. Places that were good had the water profile. It's it's greened up. Other places are just yeah. dirt brown. You can it's see a good it. tool. It's a wonderful tool, and it's it's paid for itself, guys. And what you've just said is really an important piece of all this. It's another tool in the toolbox. It's not the panacea that's going to correct everything, no. but it's a toolbox. And one of the things you could say is, man, we've been doing this for years the same way. And that's great because you've been doing it for years, you know your farm, you know your land. It's uh, it's working for you. But if you can throw just another tool and in this there. other stuff, we'll grow into it. We're already doing the old fashioned way, I guess. It's just another tool to help help do it better. 
I wanted to mention one thing about that variable rate prescription as well. It doesn't have to go into precision ag machines or equipment. It can just be identified as to where the GPS coordinates are, where on your field it is, and then you can do the prescription off that. It doesn't necessarily have to go in, plug into a GPS. Well, if I'm getting old, I don't remember. I couldn't remember even if I had a GPS. <laughs> That's why I have all the younger guys doing all that stuff. <laughs> No, Abdel, did you have a... Oh, I, I, was, I agree. I agree. Because uh, you can do instantaneous... Uh, you can take action, you know, within hours, within days, within weeks, especially with water. And I think uh, disease control will be, you know, will be another good use for it. And weed control will be another use. And then the another use I see is in crop insurance. Because it could tell you where you could do the, your sampling. It will give you a map and you can say, well, I'll go take a sample here, take a sample there, take a sample there. For, so for crop insurance, I think it will be a really good tool, it, maybe already used. It is. And for land management, with that elevation map you're talking about, that's another very good tool to use. Thank you, that's true. And they are good tools in a number of different ways. In the insurance industry, for crop insurance has already been using them. It's quick. Get me another time, Steve. It's uh, 11 30, 11 20. Got any? Yeah, yeah. It's sort of a bit of change of subject, but I hear from uh, friends or researchers about their very heavy use of satellite data and contractors that process that satellite data and sell it to whoever. And, and one of their big customers is uh, Wall Street types that trade commodities. You know, they, they want real-time global data on vegetative health indexes for putting their bets on the table about crop commodities. but. I'm wondering in terms of if there's a line between drone collected data and satellite collected data and the different contractors that are trying to get that, you know, data to uh, different customers in a timely manner. I mean, you know, drones operate at a lower altitude. They can be done like we need it either Tuesday or Wednesday next week, you know, I don't know when the type of data or the frequency that the satellite data is available, but have you ever gotten any sense of where the line is between drone collected data and that in industry and how much they're going to overlap or complete, compete with satellite collected data? I'm processing. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I don't have an answer. I got to follow on. This is just a personal observation. Big Brother's watching. Okay, if I can get this same data, which it's going to come personally from my farm, without we get satellite data, and for what it is, it's good. But like I say, maybe Wall Street's watching me too. I don't know. Well, that's kind of paranoid. <clears throat> Oh! Well, no, actually, that yeah, technology was developed during the Cold War yes. by the CIA, so but, we can keep track of But something like this, <clears throat> maybe we can protect our identity, I don't know. Because it is, it's here. It's for us. It's not for Wall Street or something right. else. That's right. Um, the system that I use does not depend on internet, so that helps. Uh, the processing, unfortunately, does. Maybe that would cut Joel out. He's going to be able to go to his computer and see what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll still give you access, Joel. <laughs> well, I, I, I have access both ways. Yeah. Internet or Wi-Fi or none at all. Um, but going back to what, what you were saying, the fine line between the drone collected data and the satellite collected data. You, you brought up the good points already that cause a difference between the two. 
lower resolution, not lower resolution, but lower ceiling height. We don't fly through clouds. We don't get obscured by those things. Um, help me, I have a still processor. But the quick scheduling. Yeah. The turnaround is fast. Yeah, but the real time thing is like you've been saying. It's just so key. Time. You can't it's beat real time. time. You know, and, it's and it's like, is, you know, from what you're saying, it's like you've seen benefits of it, and can we expand on? We can always get better. At always get get better at it. I mean, the equipment's going to get get better. We know that, and and the software is going to get better. But it's expanding into saying, okay. Is just our nitrogen costs. You know, I, I'm real curious about the fertilizer. I like the idea of kind of being able to forecast your moisture levels in your uh, watering schedule. You know, in a center pivot, it's easier to react to that. How do you react with the sidewall? You know, it's tough. You, yeah, it's tough. But um, it's tough. you know, it's. You know, these are things that I guess we need to kind of hash through, and hopefully next summer, you know, Greg and I are working on a grant to, for the conservation district to work on some of this, and with the help of people here, if we can get input, you know, then we can maybe come up with some more answers. That's a, you just got me processing again. If, if you have comments, questions, discussion items, anything. Is there some way we can go onto your website and have a spot where they can put that in? So I, can I, gather I, some I think we can, you know, create like a blog kind of a thing. Is that uh, a blog or somewhere? Yeah, that I, I'm sure there's a way to do it. I think the best way is probably use a telephone. <laughs> I like those better too. You know, call them and talk to Victoria, or leave a message or whatever, you know, or give me a call or whatever, or Greg. Uh, or call me. Yeah, or Blair. I mean, I think we're all in this trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And, and I'm the first one to admit that I'm, I've got lots of questions about it. You know, there's some things that are real obvious, but phase two, I don't know. Well, I, I have some questions on, is it is this technology going to be antiquated in 10 years? Kind of talking about like some of the satellite, yeah. satellite stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah, yeah, I mean, it will be. And, and along with this gentleman said he was looking at contour data, I know that my office, we've been working to try to get uh, what they call LIDAR data, for, mm -hmm. and we're, it's looking like we're going to have maybe LIDAR data for the entire county by next summer. Nice. So all of a sudden that nice. cuts out a market for, for the drones. Um, to a degree. Potentially, because I mean, yeah. if I got, if I, depending on what it is, if I got six inch contour data, nice. that's going to be pretty hard to beat with a drone. I would think. Um, well, and, but but I look at it from two things. Number one is what can can you know a farm owner do on their own? I think from and a then what what can we do awesome. on on the high end side? We've got two different things. I'm not saying yeah. okay, you know, you rent, you pay somebody to come out and fly this. Now you need to know right now. You need to know. Yeah, I got plug sprinklers. I've got that. But then that next level that is is. You know, economically difficult to do on a one 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 to one basis. This is where you jump into the you know the analysis, and we don't know if that analysis is worthwhile. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the, I'm, I'm sorry. Please, Bob. Just a quick question. You know, it seems like I personally would like to uh, participate in a user group for people who are using these, so we can bounce ideas off. We've got something high desert to facilitate beyond just. Uh, calling into to a number uh, in case there are not parties interested, because I, I can see value of that for myself. I I don't see why not. You know we're limited in, in our time and and what we can do. I mean if we had a string of employees, it'd be great. But you know I I think helping facilitate some of that stuff, yeah. I might just Rich. chime in on that. So we're pitching a drone pilot project to the San Juan Basin Roundtable tomorrow. And what that, you know, the brief summary on that is we envision this as a, as a, a collaborative effort with Dolores County and the Mancus Conservation District. And we would retain some of Blair's uh, services as well. And 
possibly provide a service, Bob, uh, where we would come out. We, we initially just want to map four or five fields, regularly flying them and comparing them against themselves under different management uh, practices. Uh, the other thing we want to do is really find where the utility is with these things. You know, Steve has a great point about the variable rate stuff, but it sounds like some of that can be mitigated. So where is the sweet spot in there? Um, so yeah, there's if we get some, some money thrown our way, we're going to be studying this a lot more next year. And then after that, we may have a lot better idea where the value is, how that compares with what NRCS has going, uh, and, 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 it, and then evolve you know, from there. We have to use every avenue. We need to use his data. It's good data. We need oh, yeah. to use it and incorporate it, layer it in, <clears throat> and our layers may change every year mm -hmm. as this improves. Mm -hmm. This is right at the, the base. This contour mm -hmm. and soil types. Mm -hmm. You lay these other things over the top. Your, your yield maps, your yield data, that kind of comes after the season. But there's still all these things. I can see an integration that we they're all important. And you can take historical data, yes. and you can take aerial collected data, and combine them. It's one, it may not do it all, but it may add to what we're doing. Right. Right. Related to what the work you're doing on looking at specific points on your pivot, how practical with the technology we have now is it to lay out a map that says go up to 50 feet, fly to the, fly to give me uh, 15 seconds of video on this point, this point, this point throughout an irrigation system. Is that within the scope of some of these free mapping programs or or if not? I, I'm not sure about you know whether you can sequence bursts like that. I suppose you could. You can with the Litchi app. Can you? Yeah. Which and, and so that's that's where you know finding out there, there's a there's different data from a still than a video, and, and you can see different things, you know, your eye is focusing differently. And that's where I think there's value in both ways to do it. And it's just like, you know, for me to do those clips, you know, it took me 45 minutes, whatever, to condense 15 minutes down into something that's usable. Uh, and and, and we're, this is just right on, the, you know, the beginning edge of, for me, is to, you know, how to use it and what to use and, and hopefully this is what, you know, we can find out and, and help help do it so that we can spread this knowledge around. Are, are there any other questions? I know that we, we promised we'd get you out of here before noon and, and I just want to, I want to thank Katie and CSU for, for letting us use this facility. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no question. And uh, did you have some comments you wanted to make? You... I just wanted to get a quick show of hands who's from Dolores County in here. Oh. A couple of three. Kenny, too. Three, right? <laughs> Kenny, right? Yeah. How about yeah. that Mancus Conservation District folks? Anybody in here from over there? Oh. Here, Perry, is he here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the evaluation form. Yeah, we do have a, a little evaluation thing that uh, I can start some of these around if you want to. This is more of make comments of what you want to see. You know, because the conservation district is here to kind of try and, and get some information from you so how we can help out. Uh, and I, I want to thank Blair especially for, for coming over. We have this group just like Van Light. We have a hat for you from oh, well, Idaho Conservation District. This is a little, little gift for you and your wife. Uh, and I appreciate you coming. And let's kind of keep the conversation going. If, if you guys want to fly some more, I like flying. We can go out here and if you want to try some specific things. If you're curious as to how the sensors work, then we can fly into the building and see if I can wreck it. Maybe, maybe you can make a comment on the form if you would. You know, we're looking at, they're going to the round table tomorrow to try and pitch this idea. Is this something that you folks feel would be useful if the high desert had yes. a service yes. like this and the expertise um, to pull this off? We need to know because this is not going to be just free money coming our way. There'll be a match involved. 
and um, you know our funds are limited. The mill levy took a lot out of us, and that that was a tragedy. What happened to us in the county over that mill levy effort, and um, so we can do this, but we need to know: is this really what you want? So make a comment on reform. So we're not just spinning our wheels again on something that nobody's interested in. Yeah, I'm going to comment to your flying into the building. Most pilots, it's not if you land wheels up, it's when. When. Okay. So be prepared. Yeah, well, that's, you know. How many we pilots are here? Are here? Are oh, pilots. <laughs> Drone, drone, drone pilots. How many drone pilots are here? I don't want to crash. Who's got no protection? Oh yeah. Myself. Oh hey. Question: How many how many pilots are here? Drone pilots. Certified. Yeah. Certified, licensed. Drone okay. pilots or air carriers? Well, drone pilots. About four, sort of commercial or about four of us here. Commercial or private? Well, you're the thing for farmers is you don't have to have a license to fly. The district would, though, to be a commercial. Correct. Yeah. Now, if you're right. going to sell the footage and make money, yes, you have to have your license. So, right. yeah, yeah, certified it's license. The 107 license. I know Mike's got one. Yep. You've got a 107 license. Yeah, I got one. And yeah, so see, that's that's part of this whole legal thing, and we got to be safe with it. Right. If we're not safe with it, we're going to take it away. Even That's kind of what I look at. Even if you're a hobby pilot, what do you work for? pilot film. I work for myself. I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, okay. Profits yeah. from yeah. it. Yeah. It's still yeah. Yeah. You can't do yeah. it. Sure. Right. To sell, to give your, for free to somebody right. else. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's just, you know, just to be safe about it, and we've got to be legal about it. Oh, okay. And But the, the opportunity here on the farm is we're not dealing with so many other properties and privacy issues. I think this can be expanded into something that, it's really helpful for running the farms. You know, I mean, we've got to make money out of it. Yeah. If we can't make money farming, we might as well just dream on. Yeah. It's always next to Crack, you know, bust our pots and be like well, the other size and head south. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions, comments? Well, I thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it.